Dear audience, we are here today again with Pastor Willie Oliver. Welcome again. Thank you. I will ask him about his duties and his ministry, and then we'll be talking about marriage after 10 or 20 years of being together. Brother Willy, this is the way we speak in Romania, brother. Frater. Frate. You are a brother in Christ, and you are uh, educated and in love with this uh, department of family. Tell us about what you do or what you have done hmm. for so many years. Thank you. Thank you for having me again. Well, I, as you said, uh, I do direct family ministries for the Seventh-day Adventist Church. I work at World Headquarters in the Washington, D.C. area and have been uh, leading this uh, ministry with my wife for the last almost 12 years. Um, we're both uh, well trained in this area. Uh, of course, I'm a trained minister. I have degrees in theology and pastoral counseling, a graduate degree in pastoral counseling, and my PhD is in sociology in the area of gender and family. And of course, I'm also a certified family life educator for, from the National Council on Family Relations in the United States. My wife is a licensed uh, counseling psychologist, and uh, also she's an educational psychologist, and also a certified family life educator. So together we work at World Headquarters for the Seventh-day Adventist Church. In our work, we train leaders of family ministries around the world. The Seventh-day Adventist Church is organized, I was going to say divided, but we're not divided, we're organized in 13 world divisions. Uh, three in the Americas, the South American Division, headquartered in Brazil, uh, the North American Division, headquartered in the United States, and the Inter-American Division, also headquartered in Miami, in the United States. But that deals with, with uh, Central America, with Mexico, with the Caribbean islands, and with Venezuela and Colombia in South America. So, and then we go to Europe, and we have three uh, divisions of the General Conference in Europe, in Moscow, the Euro-Asia Division, in uh, Bern, Switzerland, the Inter-European Division, of which Romania is a part, and in the UK, the Trans-European Division, and they mostly deals with um, Northern Europe or Western Europe or what have you, even though some countries are divided between the two European divisions. And then we have Africa three divisions in Africa. In Kenya, Nairobi, the East Central Africa Division, and it deals with all the countries in that region. And then we have the West Central Africa Division based in Abidjan, in the uh, Ivory Coast, and it deals with West African countries. And then the Southern African Indian Ocean Division with headquarters in South Africa, and it deals with Southern African nations, including the islands in the Indian Ocean. Seychelles, Mauritius, Madagascar, Reunion, those islands there. And then of course, we have the Southern Asia Pacific Division based in Manila in the Philippines and it deals with all that region. And then the Northern Asia Pacific Division headquartered in Seoul, South Korea, and it deals with the Northern Asia countries. And then we have the South Pacific Division based in Sydney, Australia and it deals with, with Australia, New Zealand, and those South Pacific islands, including Papua New Guinea, uh, Solomon Island, Vanuatu, the Polynesian Islands, Cook Islands, all those islands. So it's a big job. So we do training. World is your parish. That's right. We do training, but more than that, we develop resources. We have churches all over the world, and every year in the Seventh-day Adventist Church, we have two weeks of family emphasis. In February, what we call Christian Home and Marriage Week, and then in September, what we call Family Togetherness Week. And lately, we've been calling it Family Togetherness Week of Prayer, especially during the pandemic. We've been praying for our families, and it's an instructive time to turn to God with our families, to lead them to God and recognize that the, strengths, the strength of families is based on their faith in God. 
We write, we research, we, um, we teach. Sometimes we teach at the graduate level, doctoral students. I'm an adjunct professor at Andrews University in the United States and also an adjunct of the Adventist University of Africa in the uh, region of, it's based in, in Kenya. And then I also teach for the Inter-American Adventist Seminary in the Inter-American Division. So a lot of teaching, uh, a lot of uh, researching, a lot of writing. We write columns, we write books. We have a television program, Real Family Talk, with Willie and Elaine Oliver on the Hope Channel. It's seen in many parts of the world. And it's in English, but in many other parts. It gets dubbed into other languages and with subtitles and what have you. We're trying to do all we can to help families, not only in the Seventh-day Adventist Church, but in the regions where our churches are. That means all over the world to be stronger, healthier, and contributing members of society. How do you see yourself as a man of God and a disciple of Christ um, when the world is your parish and you do television, teaching, uh, instructing, counseling? Don't you feel overwhelmed or don't? How do, how do you perceive this, this tremendous burden, you know, pleasant, but also Yes, that's the tension of life. You know, that's the tension of life. It doesn't matter what you do. There's always a tension. And the tension is a need and then fulfilling that need. And um, I believe that God has given people talents and vocations and burdens. Okay, my burden has always been for stronger and healthier families from when I was a child, from when I was a boy. You know, my dad was a minister and I used to speak to my father when I was in primary school. And I would speak to him about family and I said, you know, Dad, you know, the church would be a better place if the families were stronger. I had those conversations with my dad when I was 10, <laughs> you know. And so uh, for me, it's been a passion for forever. And um, there was never a time that I thought that I would get married and my marriage would not work. I always felt that it didn't matter who I married that I was going to have a strong and healthy marriage because that was my attitude about marriage and the importance of marriage. I had two godly parents who were wonderful uh, human beings and Christians. And uh, I feel blessed that I had the privilege to, to, to be raised in their home with biblical values and love for God and love for uh, our fellow human beings. And how can we contribute to the greater good. So I get that privilege and opportunity to interact with people all over the world who want to do whatever they can to help families to be stronger and healthier. So it's a privilege. And overwhelmed, I, it's not so much overwhelmed. I think it's, uh, I'm, I'm just humbled that God would ask me to do something like this with Elaine, the love of my life. And uh, so for us, it's a privilege. And, and we, we don't take it for granted. Uh, we don't take any of it for granted. It's a privilege. We love people. We love different cultures. We love different foods. So here we are in, uh, in Romania, and uh, we're talking about Zakuska, and we're talking about Mama Liga. I know, you know, you, you do more Mama Liga in Moldova and what have you, but I love it all, and I enjoy it. And uh, I just try to... Uh, to take life one day at a time, always planning for the future, but living today. What will I do today to make my marriage happier and to help somebody else to have Thank a happy you. marriage? Thank you. I'll try to, to shoot a lot of questions and ask you to give some, some quick responses. First, what continent or what region or culture do you think it's more difficult to deal with when it comes to marriage? Um, that's a hard question. Or the other way around. What culture is, is the easiest? The easiest. Oh, it's hard to say. I mean, because we, we're pretty much uh, human beings and we're all inherently selfish. <laughs> <laughs> you know? So whether it's Europe or Asia or Africa or Latin America or, or the Americas. The you symptoms know? might be different, but the disease yeah, is the same. The disease is the same. Sin, sin is an is a, is a, you know, insidious disease. 
and it affects relationships, especially relationships. Uh, that's how sin entered into the world through Adam and Eve, you know, when they chose to listen to the serpent rather than to listen to God. Okay, thank you. The, another question. What difference does believing in God with all your heart make in a marriage? Because I, I, I think you, you have counseled um, a lot of non-believers' marriages and you try to help everyone. But did you see that the Word of God, the prayer, you know, being religious in a very personal way is a help and why? Yeah. I would use the word spiritual rather than religious uh, just because of its connotation. Spiritual in meaning that you are connecting with God. You will believe in God. Um, God invented marriage and family. It's his idea. So if I have a, a Skoda, right? I'm going to go to that company to get my car serviced. They know how the car was made. They know what it needs to make it run best. So since God is the creator of marriage and family, yes, if you're a believer and you believe that with God all things are possible and the Bible says love is patient, love is kind, the Bible is instructive to me as a human being, as a father, as a husband. Uh, back to Ephesians that you referenced in earlier on another program. Uh, it says, and people like to say, Ephesians 5.22, wives, submit to your husbands. The heart of that passage is verse 25. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. Unless you believe in God, unless you believe in Christ, you don't have that gem. You don't have that catalyst to remind you that husbands ought to love their wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself. He died for the church so that even though sinners, we can have access to salvation. So in essence, the husband becomes salvation to his wife by loving her like God, like Christ loved the church. With um, patience, with yes, kindness, kindness, with yes. sacrifice, yes. with things that are against our sinful nature. That's correct. And it's the very same author of Ephesians that authors First and Second Corinthians. But what if I'm right? What if we are right as husbands? As husbands? What if you're right? Yeah, what, what if I uh -huh. uh, deserve uh, ah, something? Uh, yeah. What if uh, the truth is on my side? You yes, know? you know, I hear that a lot in, in almost every marriage. Uh, uh, we've also studied with Dr. John Gottman, which is one of the leading, he and his wife, Dr. Julie Gottman and Dr. John Gottman, leading marriage researchers in the world. We've uh, been trained with them. Both my wife and I are Gottman therapists, you know, and we've done some training with him. You are blessed. And, I've only written some of his <laughs> books. So here's the deal. You know, he says, you're both right. This is what Dr. John Gottman likes to say. You're both right. And what he means is, we're all right in our own eyes. We know what we're talking about. We see it from our perspective. And so he says, yeah, if you look at things from your perspective, you're right. If you look at things from your perspective, you're right. You're both right. So what do you do with that? What do you do with that? You take turns being right, right? But if you go to the Bible, we talk about being right. I think what's most important is being loving. That's most important. Loving the other person, yes. not loving ourselves. Correct. Yeah. Loving the other person. It's not so much, hey, I'm right, you know. My wife likes to say, because this is what happens with couples, is that they remember things differently. And they're sure that the way they remember it is the way it happened. And so she's come up with this phrase that says, memory is a relative of the truth is not its twin. So this is your memory. And so your reality is relative to the memory that you have. That may not be everything that happened, and the other person may not remember that, but it's your truth. Okay, it's not absolute truth. The only absolute truth is God in the Word of God. So human beings need to remember that they're both fallible, nobody's perfect, so what we're trying to be here is like God, but allow God's spirit to dwell in us, which is a spirit of kindness.
patience, gentleness, and peace. That's what needs to happen in marriage so that we can all reflect the image of God. So back to your original question, believers and non-believers. I think that non-believers have the capacity to develop skills and to be ethical and what have you, but they don't have the strength that you receive from the God of the universe. And that God performs miracles, just like in the book of John, chapter 2, where the first miracle performed by Jesus when his ministry started was at a wedding, wedding. in Cana. And I say to people, look at what Jesus did at the wedding in Cana. He performed a miracle when they ran out of wine. I believe every marriage who is functional, that's a miracle. Every marriage, I say that to people, every marriage, and certainly mine, we need a miracle every day, which means we need the presence of Jesus in our homes, in our marriages, every day. And I will take that, accept that. I'd rather have that than not have it. What can you say in a few words now at the end of the show? to those who struggle in their marriage with the following issue. I'm trying to be kind, I'm trying to be patient, I'm, but, but it's not mutual. In the other one, it's not like I perceive him or her not being good, but he says, I don't like, I don't want, I don't think we will make it. So when it's not mutual, it's kind of n not enough. What should we do? Divorce is not uh, best option. That's um, right. Getting into fighting doesn't solve a thing. Um, speaking bad words, which we regret afterwards, again, not, not a good thing. But a lot of people, a lot of wives and, or husbands, live ear by ear with, with this dysfunctionality in their marriage. W what? What words of comfort or advice can you share with them? You know, um, that's a great question. And uh, before you finish the show, I'm really, this is one of my burdens. I mean, at the end of a marriage, they tend to be happy. But in the end of the marriage, they tend not to be happy. They, they almost can't stand each other. A lot of people. They, okay, they don't separate, they don't fight, but love is all times gone. So, on the other hand, they want to be respectful, they want to not to lose their relationship with God, they're not to lose the children in the family. There's a lot at stake, mm. but we need, we need to comfort them, not from the position when you are, you're having a blessed marriage, and I'm, I'm in a miracle myself, but not all of them are still, they are loved by God, and we, we cherish them the same. What should your mes message be to them? Here's my message. My message is you can't control what anybody does. You can't control what your spouse does. You can only control your response. So don't worry about what your spouse is doing or not doing. You need to make up your mind as to what kind of marriage you want to have. We call it being proactive. You know, it's the first habit in the seven habits of highly effective people, the seven habits of highly effective marriages of Dr. Stephen Covey. Be proactive, number one. Part of cognitive behavioral therapy, you know. How do you make choices? How are you proactive? How do you choose regardless of what the other person is doing. The Bible also says, love begets love. If both people go to their corners as boxers and just stay over there, nothing is ever gonna happen. There's not ever gonna be peace. There's not ever gonna be truce. If we're really Christians, and by the way, I'm going to challenge the Christians in not so good marriages. It's not possible. If you're really a Christian, the love of God is in you. And that love is not about what can I get. That love is about what can I give. Look at the Word of God. Look at the Bible. The book of John, chapter 3 and verse 16, which we're so familiar with. 
for God so loved the world that he gave. Definition of love is to give, yes. not to Definition receive. Definition is to give. It is more blessed to give than to receive, the Apostle Paul says. So if we can take that, that nugget from the Bible, and apply it to our marriages, then wake up this morning with the notion of, oh, I have a bad marriage. No. What can I do for my spouse that will make them feel loved? The Bible says love begets love. It's like a bank account. In social scientific research, we call it the emotional bank account. Let me, let me paint the picture to you. What is an emotional bank account? It works just like a regular bank account. If you put currency in, you've got more money. If you make withdrawals, you've got less money. When we make emotional deposits in someone's life, let's say our mate, our spouse, our wife, our husband, when you're kind, that's an emotional deposit. Uh, when you say nice words to them, that's an emotional deposit. When you say nasty words, that's an emotional withdrawal. If you have more withdrawals than deposits, soon your relationship is bankrupt. You're in debt. Yes, your relationship is bankrupt. There is no currency left in the marriage. So we cannot make a decision for our mate, but we can make one for ourselves. And today, I want to challenge all your viewers and say, what can you do today to make an emotional deposit in the emotional bank account of your wife? of your husband. Forget what they're not doing. This is your project. This is you asking the Spirit of God to live in you, to work with you, to work through you, to flow through you. Do something nice. If you know your husband likes a certain meal, cook him his favorite meal. If you know your wife likes the yard to be nice and clean, clean the yard for her. Even if you don't think he or she deserves this, even it's if It's not she, about deserving. It's, she's not thankful. It's not about... No, 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 no. Look, we're, if we're Christians, if we're truly Christians, then we are disciples of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, what did he do? The Bible says, while we were yet sinners, he died for us. The Bible says, by grace you are saved. What is grace? Unmerited favor. You don't deserve grace. You don't deserve salvation. That's how we need to love our mate, through grace. If everyone did that, Romania would be a transformational place, a transformed place. Every marriage in this country would be what God wants it to be. Forget about what your spouse is doing or not doing. You determine what you're going to do to change the reality. It takes one to change it. Thank you for your words, and thank you for, for going back to the Bible and to the example of the Lord. Dear audience, may this message be in your heart. Do as the Lord did. The Father gave His Son to us. The Son gave His life for us. You as a husband, give some of your time and your uh, whatever you can to make her happy. And you as a wife, make him happy. May this, this love from God bless all your marriage and family. Thank you again, and may the Lord protect you all over the world where you travel. Thank you. It's good to be with you.